I opened my eyes and all I could see was a hood now. I could see the face, but it was this black cloak entity at the end of my bed. I'm like, oh no, not today. And as it raised its face up, I was like, that's a demon. And like, and I freaked out. So I go to the movie, I'm all excited. And when I saw him, I freaked out all over again. And I said, that's what was at the end of my bed. I was telling you guys about a couple of years ago. I said, that's, that's him exactly, identical. And right away I knew that whoever created that character was not only in the occult, but extremely high up in the cult because when they created that character, that is based on a real demon or fallen angel that's out there in the spirit realm. Hello and welcome to the Almost False Podcast where I interview regular people with incredible stories. Today's guest is not the kind of person you hear of very often. He's been seeing and hearing things ever since he was a child and has had countless encounters with spiritual beings. We talked about many of them, two of which were heavily tied with Hollywood and the occult. But before that, let's go back into the childhood of today's guest. Chris. So as a as a child, God was never brought up. We never went to church. Uh, the only thing I knew about church was the building across the street that the bells would toll on the hour. And you know what hour of the day it was based on the church. And at 12 and 6 on the hours, you would hear music and whatnot. Well, in that, there was no church. There was no talking about God, prayer, any of that. Um, so. I didn't know until I got older that my mom, since she was young, I guess you would say, could see into the spirit realm, see angels, demons, uh, and whatnot. But again, as a child growing up, I had no clue about anything spiritual when it came to my parents. And you were seeing these things and you felt like you were crazy. Uh, meanwhile, your mom was experiencing the same thing. You just didn't know. But there's one thing, um, one story that's really interesting when you were a child, that it's a dream that came, well, dream, I call it a dream, but you you would say probably it's it's real spiritual experience uh, w that happened again and again and again, and it continued to happen for all, pretty much your whole life. Yeah. Um, so as a, as, a, as a young child, you know, a child, and you can just see this with any child if you have kids, but children have a hard time knowing, okay, what was a dream? What was reality? I was at that age where I didn't know what was going on, but somewhere around two, three o'clock, two, three years old. At the time, I thought it was dreams, but I realized now that I was actually walking out or being rolled out into the spirit realm. But it would happen the same way. I would, I would pop out in my sleep, and my spirit man would walk out of my bedroom, which was right near a door that had an internal staircase and went out of the basement. I go down the first flight and then hook to go down the second flight down into the basement. And I would be greeted by this demon. And this demon was massive. It had long, stringy, white gray hair. It had deep, huge black eyes with a little light in the center of it, um, a, like a torn up t shirt and, and pants. And it wouldn't touch me, but it was just almost like cover me in, in a very mean and demeaning way. And it's, I just remember its fingers and its nails were just long and gnarly. And it would, growing up up north, I would, it, I would describe it as it was trying to punk me. It was trying to put me in, in my place, kind of like a bully on a schoolyard. Bully doesn't need my lunch money, but he's going to punk me and scare me into giving me my lunch money anyways. And that started in my earliest memories, two, three years old. And it, it happened pretty much all my life. I'm 47 years old. And sometimes it would be, you know, a couple nights in a row. Sometimes it'd be once a week. Sometimes it'd be once a month or a year. I think the longest I ever went, that was maybe a year or two without this thing returning back. It was always the same. I go to sleep. My spirit man would wake up out of my body. Boom, there it is. And it would just do everything it could to just drive fear into me. Right. And now that you're older, that you get these experiences, obviously, you know what a dream feels like and you know what's not a dream. So you can look back and say that uh, it wasn't a dream when you were young. You didn't really understand back then. But as such a young age, you also had other spiritual experiences, one of which was a dream about the future, some kind of prophetic dream, which is a really cool story in and of itself. So I want you to talk about it because that was fascinating to me when I first heard it. Yeah. So. When you're in a prophetic, part of the prophetic is that when God takes you in to see something, you're seeing it in the spirit realm. So like him, 
there is no time. So sometimes he's showing you a past. Sometimes he's showing you a present. Sometimes he's showing you a future. And in this case, it was a future. But because I was so young, I didn't know what was going on. I, to me, it was real because I know I wasn't, I, I was not in kindergarten yet. So I'm, I'm thinking three, four, four, five, maybe the oldest. Okay. But my dad had to go pick up some parts at, a, at an auto store. So we go in there, we walk in, the counter is way in the back. So we get our parts, we turn and we start walking out. And there's a good distance between the back counter and the front door. Well, these two men come walking by. And out loud, I say, Daddy, those are the guys that robbed the store. And of course, they look down at me and they're like, they, you know, in a very grimace kind of scowl kind of way. And my dad kind of got nervous. So he's just a kid. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And I said, no, Daddy, they robbed the store. To this day, my dad drove me in a store quickly is an understatement. So we get out and on our way back to the house, about halfway home, we started seeing squad cars or police cars just whizzing by us, heading back in the direction from which we had come. We get home, dad calls back to the auto parts store. Someone finally picks up and kind of find out right after we left, those two guys did indeed rob the store. But I had already seen it days or a week before. And I knew that those were the two guys that had done it. And so for this little three or four year old to call these guys out, it freaked them out. It freaked my dad out. And then when dad hung up the phone, he said, yeah, they, those guys did rob the store, you know, and it was kind of like, well, things. it was hush, hush. It was kind of like a freaky incident. We didn't really talk about it anymore, but you know, my dad just kind of looked at me like what just happened. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I would be confused too as to how you knew that, but uh, there's, you have tons of stories like that, that don't make sense in a natural world. But when you look at it with the spiritual lens, they do. But um, when you were around 10, you had a, a dream and then the dream stopped and you woke up and you saw something. So what was that like? And what did you see exactly? You know, this is cool because your first question was about my mom. And this is the first time my mom, I used to say, cracked the veil to let me see behind the scenes with her. But um, I was having a dream about some of my childhood friends. And even at 47 years old, I still remember his dream in its entirety. But as I was dreaming, it's, it's almost like back in the day, we used to listen to vinyl records. And if you kind of took the needle off, you would sometimes get that sound, but the music stops instantly. Right. What was like the dream just went zoop and it went to an all black. And all of a sudden, this guy appears and he starts talking to me. And I remember the conversation. And when he got done talking, I freak out. Now, I was sleeping on a top bunk. Our top bunk was really close to the ceiling. Like you climb the ladder, you have to like army crawl to lay down. And so the ceiling is very close. And when I, I wake up from this, Hovering above me on the ceiling is this white, misty, kind of like person or being or something. You know, at the time I didn't know what it was. And I'm looking at this thing and it sees me. I see it and I freak the heck out. And so my head's away from the door. So it kind of went down my body. And then when it got to where the door is along the ceiling, it had to go down to get, you know, under the, the, the top of the door and then went out. And I lose it. I'm shouting. I'm screaming. But it's not like a normal shout. I mean, it's just like terror. My parents come into the room. They're freaking out. My little brother's underneath me. He's, you know, freaking out. And I was just shaking. And I could not, for the first time in my life, I couldn't get my crying under control. And so I ended up spending the night in my mom and dad's room. I slept on the floor next to my dad. And um, and that was that. Now, I, I looking back at it, I laugh and some humor. I'm a big Ghostbusters fan. And if you ever seen the first Ghostbuster, there's a scene where Dan Aykroyd is dreaming and this female spirit comes above him and starts like, you know, messing with him. But when they zoom out and you actually see the full picture of it in Ghostbusters, that's identical to what was going on with me. I'm laying on my back and this thing is literally hovering above me from head to toe. Um, fast forward a week or two, I think my mom wanted things to calm down a little bit. So she said, can I ask you about this? I was like, yeah. She said, who did you see? You kept saying you saw this guy that was talking to you. And I said, he's real thin wire glasses. I said, I described his hair, I described his face, his features and all that. And she got up without saying a word, but she's very stoic. Like, And I remember that. And she walks out 
and she grabs a photo album, but it was not where the normal photo albums were kept because we we always kept the photo albums out there on the on the shelf. And she started flipping through, and before she said anything, she said, "That's the guy right there." She said, "Are you sure?" I said, "Mom, I, I'm not forgetting that guy's face." And she said, "That's my great uncle. He died when I was a little girl." And you sure? So you saw us, mom. That's that's the guy who came and saw me. And so that's when my mom kind of opened up a little bit and explained it that she too has seen things in the past. But again, this is a house we don't talk about God. We don't talk about prayer. We don't talk about the Bible. We don't talk about anything. So, you know, as a kid, I kind of kept things kind of close to my chest because I didn't want to look like the freak. I didn't want to look like that strange kid. You know, uh, you know, like I see dead people. You know, kind of thing. And I, I didn't. I just kind of, I kept that very suppressed, I guess you would say, as a kid. Right. Then that's normal. I think that that would be the normal reaction to have when you experience something that people tell you is impossible. Uh, your first reaction is not necessarily to go out into the world and tell everyone, hey, uh, I, I've seen this because they're all going to think you're crazy. So uh, I totally understand that. The interesting thing is that your mom was also able to see some things like that. So to some degree, she probably didn't think you were crazy. Maybe your dad thought you were. I don't know if you told him or not, but. It's interesting. And the interesting part is that also you didn't believe in God in that time and you didn't necessarily believe in, in much of the spirit. But later, just a few years later, at around 15, you asked Satan to reveal himself. So you didn't know God and you were like, well, I want to figure out if this Satan character is real and something pretty big happened. Yeah. And go back to my mom, you know, she finally told me that, you know, she did indeed see things. And she had an aunt that saw things. And so I realized there was some kind of connection, but I, I didn't know what it was. And then in the part of the country I grew up, I was right there at a zip code. It was one of the most incarcerated zip codes in the country. It was the most incarcerated for my state, but as it, the country as a whole. So since I was so third, fourth grade, so elementary school is when some of my friends started selling drugs. They started getting in really bad fights. By middle school, they were killing each other. Um, so you know, you go to school, a gang fight would break out, and this is middle school, and then one of your friends gets shot or stabbed to death, and they don't come back. So in my mind, I was like, well, if there is this guy that people are talking about, he must not be a loving God, because why is he letting all these things happen? And again, it's because I didn't know God. And I remember when I was 15, I was really depressed. We had just moved from my home state down here to Colson, North Carolina, and I had gotten so depressed. I had gotten so angry. And for whatever reason in my brain, it was like, there is no God, there's just the devil. But if you don't get with the devil in this world, then he's going to torment you in the next. But if you get with him, you'll be doing tormenting with him. And just this real convoluted, mixed up way of thinking. And so I literally said, all right, Satan, if you're real, you know, reveal yourself to me and, and I'll follow you kind of thing. And at that time, the whole house just shook. The only way to describe it is like if the Incredible Hulk had picked up a, a car and just shook everybody in the car. Things were rattling on the walls. You can hear things rattling on shelves. And I run out of my room and my mom looks like terror. She's like, what happened? Did you feel that? The whole house just felt like it just got moved off its foundation. And I said, I don't know, mom. And I ran out of the house, jumped on my mountain bike and just went pedaling as fast as I could down the road. Like it just, it, it. It, it, it scared me. Like, I was not expecting that to happen. I was thinking that, like, this little mist would come up, like, on TV and this little dude in a red hat, red uh, red suit, and a right. little pitchfork was going to show up. And, and instead, the whole house down to its foundation just rocked. I mean, it just rocked. So you were looking for a sign that Satan was real. He obviously gave you something. So how did that change you after all of a sudden having this realization that the devil was real? Well... So I've been a musician since I was five years old and music definitely got darker. I got into some really dark music, but anybody who tried to tell me about God, I got violently angry with them, like ready to fight. I just ridiculed. I, I had this disdain, this, this hatred for anybody who said they were a child of God and heaven forbid you try to even witness to me. I mean, then it was like, that was enough for me to, to go to blows with you. I mean, just a, irreverent hate for anything that had to do with God. Um, science and and everything became, I, I say, little G God. Um, I dove into science real heavy and whatnot. And um, 
I used to take pride in soapboxing, as we call it, in the middle of a classroom and just just embarrassing Christians because they, they could not defend their faith. They could not defend God. And it was always, you got to take it on faith. You got to take it on faith. Well, to an atheist or a guy who believes in the devil, faith has nothing to do with it. That means nothing to us. You know, we want hard facts. We want to know. And they would just power down. And I, I hate to say it, but I, I took pride in it. And there's times where, you know, girls would just start crying to the point one girl was like, who's going to go to heaven? Who's going to go to heaven? And I was like, there is no heaven, you know? And I just got a really disdain for anything that had to do with, uh, with God. And that ramped up to in your later teenage years where uh, that pride that you talked about, you took on the task to disprove the Bible. And how did that go for you? If I can quote uh, Star Wars, delusions of grandeur. Um, <laughs> I was in the break room. I was on a lunch break. And some of the little, I call them little church ladies who were working with me came in to take a break. And so they, however, got on, they started talking about God. And the more they talked about God, the more I laughed, the more I made fun of them. You got to take it out of faith. You got to take it out of faith. I was like, ha, 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 faith. Like, what is that? You know, basically saying that the Bible was for weak-minded people and God was for people who couldn't hack it on their own. I, I just was pulling out all the hate um, in a jovial way because I did respect these ladies. But a weird thing happens. I know it was, it was a God moment. As they walked out, like out of nowhere, this younger guy who I, I had a lot of respect for popped in around the corner. And we're just alone at this point. He's like, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He's like, have you ever thought about disproving the Bible? I was like, no. And he said, well, of everybody I've ever met, I've always wanted to see if it could be done. I think he'd be the guy to do it. And like I said, delusions of grandeur. I, I literally envisioned like notebooks just full front and back you know, of all the different things you could disprove. Now, in my world, you can't disprove something if it's not taken as a fact. You know, every, it, other than that, it's just a hypothesis. It's, a, you know, it could or couldn't be. So I knew I had to go into this as if this was fact and it had to be disproven. And when I say that, as a kid, I didn't watch cartoons or read comic books or play video games. I was either playing music or I was reading encyclopedias and reading dictionaries. My mom said, as soon as I could read on my own, I, was, I would grab science books. My sister, ten years older than me, I'd grab her science books. I'd read them. I'd read encyclopedias, read dictionaries. I was a sponge when it came to facts. And so I, I told myself, start at page one and read to the end. Well, through reading, I there was a, it was a very apparent um, feeling of, oh wow, I'm wrong, because the Bible really does prove science and vice versa. The history lines up. The archaeology lines up. All these things line up. And I started realizing that evolution is completely wrong because I already had this, this separation starting with evolution because you could just take evolution on its own merits and disprove it all day long. But it became a realization. And there was two things that happened. One was a factual thing that happened and one was a spiritual thing that happened. The factual thing was when I got to Moses and God said to Moses, if you touch any dead or unclean thing, take ashes of the red hef heifer, hyssop, cedar, and wash in running water. Now, let's fast forward a minute. It wasn't until the late 1800s, early 1900s, we started to find out about germs of bacterium. If a, man, if a doctor was working on a corpse, he would take his bloody hands, dip them in a standing basin of water that had been there all day long, go deliver the baby and the baby and the mother had a high chance of dying because of what? Bacteria infection. Go back to what God told Moses way back in the day. Ashes red heifer creates lie. Hyssop is a very strong antibacterial agent in plant form. Cedar is an irritant when it gets on skin. And then he said, wash it running waters. Well, the water, whatever wasn't killed, goes downstream away from where you are. So you literally have created one of the strongest antibacterial soaps you could make. And God said, wash with this when you touch any dead or unclean thing. Then it struck me. I was like, well, how did they know to do this? Moses was the most learned man in Egypt at the time. And in their just historical documents, they thought dung created life. So they used dung for things. Babies crying, feed them dung. Why? Because the cherub would take a piece of dung, roll it in a ball. And then a couple of days later, little baby cherubs would come out. So they thought dung created life. So this goes against what he knew to do. And so that, that, that woke me up. And then the spiritual side was, 
Now I'm reading about prophets, you know, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha. And they were hearing God's voice. They were seeing heavenly visions. And for the first time, I was like, that's me. I'm not different. I'm not strange. I'm just special and, and, and cut differently for God's purpose in my life. And so all of a sudden, this peace came over me from the stuff I've been seeing since I was two, three years old and had no clue what was going on. I started to understand why someone would come up to me I never met. And it's like I knew their whole life stories because that was that anointing in me, that Holy Ghost, you know, was was talking to me, but I had no clue. So it was like a double awakening. My science side of my brain and my spiritual side came together. And I was, I was like, God, you're for real. I'm sorry. And I ended up giving my life to God. This is so interesting because you came into it with the idea that you were going to disprove it. And while you did that, you realized that in the text, there's things that they could have not possibly known. It was impossible for them to know. And yet it's written there. And it's like thousands of years ago. And at the same time, it gave you an explanation for the things that you didn't know, one of which you weren't too sure about evolution. It explained parts of that. But most importantly, it explained what no one else was able to explain to you, these experiences that you had lived throughout your life. And all of a sudden, everything just makes sense when you look at it through the lens of the Bible. Yeah. But remember, it only came out because I was dared to disprove the Bible. So it's like, I would say God tricked me into it, but you know, he knew what it would take to get me and get me back on the right path. All right. And I want to move on to some other stories that you have, because throughout your life, you've had many episodes, one of which was you saw um, you saw some kind of demon. You woke up and there was a person, I guess, on the edge of your bed. What's that story yeah. all about? <laughs> yeah. Now, this one shook me up as an adult. So as I got older and once, once I gave my life to God, I realized, okay, God or a spirit realm can wake your spirit man up out of your body and then you can go places. You know, you hear people in the Bible where they went to second heaven or third heaven or whatever, or they got translated somewhere else. But so I knew there was between dreaming and coming out. I call it rolling out. And so I got really tired middle of the day, just super tired all out of nowhere. So I go lay down. And as I'm laying down, I'm dreaming. And all of a sudden I felt this energy rushing over me. And I was like, oh man, I'm about to roll out. So I open my eyes and I see this black hooded all I could see was a hood now. I didn't see the face, but it was this black cloak entity at the end of my bed. I'm like, oh no, not today. So I kind of I learned that I can shake myself in that and a lot of times I'll pop back in. I didn't pop back in. I opened my eyes again and there it was again. I'm like, dang it, no, not today. Uh uh-uh. uh. I ain't going, I ain't doing this. And so third time it did it, and I was like, you know what, it's just it won't go away until I look at it. So I rolled up the third time I was sitting up and I'm looking at it. And this time, and again, it's, it's, it's bowed, so it's, it, there's a cloak in its face. And as it raised its face up, I was like, that's a demon. And like, I freaked out. And I ended up, I woke up, and for the next two, over two weeks, I did not sleep, nap, or anything without all the lights on. Now, I'm the kind of person, I want it dead quiet, and I want it as pitch black as it can be when I go to sleep. I slept with lights on, grown young man, and I'm every light on is in the house, and I'm freaking out. Well, I didn't realize what I had seen and what the imp- implications of it were until years later. The new Star Wars movies were coming out, so they were going back to season one, two, and three episodes. I'm sorry, episodes one, two, and three. They started back in the seventies with four, five, and six, and so. I go to the movie, I'm all excited, and it gets to the scene where Darth Maul comes into the movie, on uh, scene in the movie. And when I saw him, I freaked out all over again because I went with a bunch of my friends from the, the band I was in and the ministry I was in. And I said, that's what was at the end of my bed. I was telling you guys about a couple of years ago. I said, that's, that's him exactly, identical. I mean, the black cloak, the, the orangish eyes, the red skin with the black uh, stripes on it to a T. The only thing I didn't see was that he never took his cloak off when he was visiting me in my room. So I didn't see the old things on his head. But other than that, it was him. And right away, I knew that whoever created that character for Star Wars was not only in the occult, but extremely high up in the occult. Because 
Demons and fallen angels don't just come visit when someone does a seance. They don't just do it. And if they do, they don't reveal themselves from head to toe in full detail unless you're up there. So I had already been praying like, God, like what's with the music industry? What's with the film industry? Is it truly in tied into the demonic? And right then God gave me that answer because when they created that Darth Maul character, that is based on a real demon or fallen angel that's out there in the spirit realm to a T. And now that also goes back to what I have been seeing since I was two or three years old, that long white hair thing with the ripped up shirt, black eyes. Mm -hmm. When I got into heavy metal, I got into a group called Iron Maiden and on the cover of their Number of the Beast album, their character Eddie is 100% identical to this thing that has been showing up my whole life that started when I was a kid. And so that also let me know that just like film, so is the music industry. The music industry is tied into some pretty dark things. And there's one thing to like come up with something, but it's a whole other thing when it resembles something that other people have seen. So I don't have to question it. I have all the proof that I need to be satisfied that those industries are tied into some really dark occultism and Satanism. Because that's two different times now that something I have seen in the spirit realm has manifested onto the screen or onto artwork. So yeah, that, that was that was a pretty uh pretty wild visitation. Yeah, but you I, you don't need to see in the spirit to see these things in the music in the film industry. Music is so obvious, painfully obvious nowadays. They just have music videos. The one that I'm thinking about recently is Doja Cat. But the fact that you you saw these characters before uh, makes it even more real and not even a question in your mind. So that's really interesting. And you mentioned a band and a ministry that you were in, and that's something that you did for a long time. So we're ta- we we're talking about your early twenties. This is something that you continued up until your thirties. Uh, you were in a in a Christian rock band, and part of that journey, somewhere in there, you had a concert. And I want you to tell the story of the concert because that is such a beautiful story, and I want to hear it from you. Yeah, so the band was Crew 277. Now, this is pre-YouTube and all this stuff, so <clears throat> TikTok. But we, so North Carolina hosts here at the coast in Wilmington, the Azale- Azalea Festival. It's the biggest festival in the state of North Carolina every year. And we had been playing on, well, we had been put on the, what they call the gospel stage. It's a teeny little side stage on one of the on one of the, the streets down there. But we would always draw a huge crowd. And the year before, we knew that they were some pretty high up um, level executives running. The Zeta Festival started showing up um, during our set and radioing and other people, and they were showing up and they kept pointing at us. So we got off stage and they're like, you know, your sound is, is too big. You got too big of a following. We want you on the main stage. You need to be a headline act from here on out. And so we're like, okay, that's cool. You know, so the next year comes around. And, you know, they confirmed, hey, are you guys going to be here? We want you guys as a headline act. Well, yeah, we'll be there. You know, just tell us when and where. So they put us on a Saturday afternoon, which at the peak of their festival. And r- after we did a sound check, one of, the, uh, one of the execs came up and said, hey, look, oh, by the way, we didn't tell you, but this isn't the gospel stage. So you can't talk about God and Jesus and salvation and give testimonies between songs. Just come up here and play your music. And we were pretty... We were pretty miffed. We were like, you know, you knew this before you ever, you know, asked us to play. Why didn't you tell us then? Well, it's because they wanted to draw the crowd. Now, our music was edgy. It was hard rock. Even a local hard rock station here would play us that night. Um, it's funny because like, you're the best effing, you know, Christian band we've heard. And I was like, well, Christian and F doesn't really go together. But the fact is that, you know, we attracted that, that worldly crowd, which is, in essence, that's ours a goal anyway, is to bring the people who wouldn't go to church and hear music. So from that standpoint, we're like, you know, we, we thought it was great. Um, our first song that we opened up with, we chose a, sec- a secular song, was by Alter Bridge called Open Their Eyes. And we wanted a song that was going to hit, you know, right off the bat, but also it was just hit the airways. It was blowing up on the airways. We wanted something that everybody would recognize because everything else we played was was you know our own uh music and whatnot and so we hit it and as soon as we hit i mean thousands of people just filled this hill this hill all the way down the hill down to the water just thousands of people filled up and they're rocking with us and and whatnot still couldn't say anything about god and we bit our we bit our our our, 
our tongues. But we noticed by about the second of the last song, this line was forming up on the side of the stage. And I'm just thinking, okay, this is the next band getting ready to come up in the roadies, whatever. They're getting ready to, because you always stage with, as your one's coming off, the other one's coming on, you're helping each other. They're taking your equipment down, you're bringing your equipment up, and it just makes it more efficient. And so we hit the last song, and I'm looking over, and the line is now going all the way down the hill. And I'm like, that's not roadies in the van. Like, what's going on? Well, we finish up, we come off stage, and it was just a whole long line of people there. They were talking about how they were, they grew up in a in a church, but they backslid or they never knew about God. Um, they were confessing, like you know, I've been using drugs off and on. Uh, I can't handle my drink. I'm an alcoholic, and literally, it was it was it was so beautiful because even though we couldn't talk about God, God and the Holy Ghost through the music spoke to these people, and we ended up you know witnessing, um, leading people to, uh, to to God, uh, you know praying with people and it just was a really beautiful moment that at first glance we were we were us we were so hurt like we can't talk about god they know this this is who we are but god still god still worked through it all and so we were very very grateful for that like i said before asking you the question it's a beautiful story and in uh, you telling the story you mentioned people that had backslid and they came back to god through your music unfortunately that's something that happened to you too as you were doing all these great things and being successful, you ended up backsliding into the world. And I want to get a little bit of an understanding of why that happened and what that situation was for you, because it's a little bit peculiar. Yeah. So I had taken on a role with the ministry church side. Now, to kind of understand how it came about, it started as a Bible study. Bible study turned into a TV show. That turned into multiple TV shows. From that, people wanted to start coming to church, so that turned into a church. And then other churches wanted to join, and so that turned into an association of churches. Well, because, you know, being a musician, uh, also being able to speak and, and, and teach, and then also pray in the prophetic, I kind of formed a little niche role where, one, if, a, if we were planning a church, we would go in and I would wear all the hats. And as a pastor came up, I'd take that hat off and they'd be a pastor and an associate pastor, music minister, youth minister and whatnot until I was out and it was completely turned over. And I was going 361, 362 days out of the year, either um, on a soundstage, uh, filming a TV show, in a pulpit, doing a concert. Uh, just I was always doing something and that it, it, it wore on me. And I remember going to the Bishop of the Association, like, man, I, something's got to give. And his reply, and then later, you know, it was more of a selfish thing. Well, you need to pray more. You need to read your Bible more. You need to fast more. And, and after a while, that just, it, it wasn't cutting it. I was, I was pouring out everything of me physically and emotionally and spiritually, but getting nothing back. And so I ended up losing the family businesses during the 08, 09 recession, 2010. I unincorporated and I just moved out of town. I left town and went to Greenville, South Carolina and went back into the, the clubbing, the partying, the drinking, the womanizing. Just I didn't lose my love for God, but I was done with the church. Um, I love God with all my heart still, but I just I, di I didn't want to have anything to do with any kind of organized church because it had in my mind and heart, it had used and abused me. And then when I was no longer functional, it kicked me to the curb. Um, and so, yeah, I, I went, I went back into sin for about a, a good five years. I had a good five year run back in the world. So, but I never lost my love for God though. That's the, the biggest thing. Like I still love God with all my heart. And what brought you back? Cause eventually you ended up coming back and, and to, to church and to ministry. And what brought you back out of that slump? I think I, the big, the biggest turning point was, you know, when you, when you first mess up and it's whether it's in church or it's in at work or whatever, you always want to blame somebody else. And I think when I had gotten far enough removed from it and I realized I had a lot to do with it too, I could have said no. I could have not done different things. Um, I think, you know, that had a lot to do with it. And then I, I just missed, I missed the praise, you know, playing and praise and worship and what for churches. I missed praying for people. I missed helping other people. And so I guess you say, I got to file the mud. I quit. Uh, I quit sulking and uh, said, all right, God. Um, I'm ready to go again. 
but this time it's been a whole different, like it's not 24, seven, seven days a week. It's, it's as God needs it, you know? Right. And you coming back to him like that ended up being a blessing to you and to many other people because God started using you in ways that uh, he had never used you before. And there's one particular story, which is very interesting that I want you to talk about when a friend called you, he had problems with ghosts or whatever, he called you for help. And that ended up being a whole situation. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I came back, I came back to the coastal North Carolina and I was driving down the road and I got this random call and it was a, it was a friend of mine. And he said, I've got some weird things going on at my shop. God just said, call you that you would have the answers. So I'm like, what? Like I have the answers. And so I was like, well, what's going on? And, and he's like, well, I don't want you to think that we're crazy. I'm like, no, did you tell me? So he's like, well, you know how in the back of the building is like my shop. I have a shop in the back and then there's a wall on the whole front of the shop in the front is like an indoor open air flea market. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, well, the girls working in the back for me, um, they come in one day and they heard somebody walk through, but when they looked up, there was nobody there and they kind of freaked out. So there was a dog that they it would go there every day to work. They grabbed the dog and they started walking through the building and all the doors were locked. There was nobody there, but they knew somebody had just walked through. And so they kind of discounted it when it was a couple more days later, not only did they feel like somebody had walked in the room, they heard it say hello and they could smell the perfume. And immediately I was like, man, you're dealing with some heavy witchcraft or, you know, that's, that's, that's something demonic. And he's like, well, I thought you would say that, but like, what do you think is going on? Well, God started dealing with me at this point. And I was driving home and I remember I, I pulled in the driveway and we kept talking and I told us that God said that there is, it's not your people. Cause he was like, well, are they doing witchcraft in there? I was like, no, it's not your people. I said, there's, there's an item that a demon was attached to and it's still attached to that item, but it's no longer with who it was supposed to be with. So it can't do anything. And it, it's just tired of being attached. It, it wants to be released. It wants to go. Well, how do you do that? I was like, well, you got to go through pray and anoint and everything. Okay. Well, how do you anoint? I was like, well, you use anointing oil and you, you know, you go in there and you pray over things. Well, how do I get anointing oil? And I said, well, it's, it's olive oil. It's been consecrated. Well, how do you consecrate it? I said, well, you fast and you pray over it. And all of a sudden it dawned on me because the week before I told my wife, I said, I feel like God is leading me to a fast, but I don't, I don't know why I'm fasting. I, I it wasn't, it didn't make sense. So we agreed, well, come Monday, I'll, I'll just go on a fast and let God lead. Well, this call came in on that Wednesday. And I said, well, it's funny you're asking this because I'm already on a fast. I said, I'll buy some oil. I'll consecrate it, pray over it. And then, you know, Monday or Tuesday the next week, we'll go through and pray through your building. Well, then God started dealing with me. And we're still on the same conversation. And I said, actually, you know, it's up front. And I said, it, God's saying it's a box. It's like a multi-purpose box. It's got like different things in it. He's like, well, I'm still here. I was like, oh crap. And so he's like, he runs out front. He's like, all right, I'm in the front of the, and I'm in the front of the building. Where do I go? Now the whole front of his building is nothing but floor to ceiling windows. And this was broad daylight. And I, God said, it's in the back, right corner if you're facing the front. And you know you're there because it's so dark in that corner, you can't see your hand in front of your face. He's like, dude, you, there is no place in here that's dark. It's wall-to-wall -wall windows, and it's sunny outside. I'm like, no, he said it's pitch black. So he goes in through the front, and he's on the phone. He gets back there, and he's like, oh, my God, there is a dark spot back here. I said, all right, it's a box. It's an old box, kind of rustic looking. It's like, you know, like it's scraped up or beat up or whatever. I don't see a box. And I heard God say, it's under something, but behind something. He's like, under something, but behind something. I was like, yeah, I'm just telling you what God said. Well, all of a sudden he's like, oh my God, here it is. And it literally was under a desk with the desk chair pushed in front of it. And now I'm geeking out. I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. And I said, it's a box, right? He's like, yeah. And, he, and I said, it's rustic. He's like, yeah, it looks kind of beat up. And he opens it up. He's like, oh man, there's all kind of like little shelving sliding boxes in here. It was, a, it was an old military trunk. And so that's when God said it was a multi-purpose trunk and that there's little things in there and it fit the teeth. So I was like, all right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get the oil, consecrate it. First week we'll pray. 
And I said, God started dealing with me about the box. So this is before I hung up the phone that day. And I, I said, God's telling me that there's a lot of hate and rage around this box. A lot of hate, a lot of rage. And I said, there, I said, the man, he cast a spell and he put a, a demon attached to that box and then gave it to his wife to torment her. And so I was like, why is God being so specific, right? Like God never usually goes that specific. So fast forward now, we get there, there's somebody there. And I'm like, great. I was like, dude, can we get him out of here? Like he's well, just a cleaning guy. I should be able to get him out. I was like, all right. So I'm waiting there. And as I'm waiting there, I look up and I saw the demon on the, on the roof. And next to the demon, I saw like a tornado next to him. And I looked up there. I said, don't worry about it. I said, we're, we're going we're gonna to cash you out here. We're going to deal with you. <laughs> and so um, 10 minutes go by, my buddy's not back. 15 minutes go by, my buddy's not back. So I walk in and he was doing the exact opposite I asked him to do. I was like, do not tell him I wanted to think we're freaks, you know, and like circus act. He's telling him, oh, yeah, we're getting ready to cast a, a demon out of here. We got a, we got a, something here with a demon on it. And I'm just going, God. I was like, man, I just moved back to this town. I don't need this, right? So I come around and I start talking to him. And God started dealing and started moving on his behalf about some things in person. We had some prayer. You know, it was a tender moment. He's, you know, he was crying and I was tearing up. And we were just, you know, hugging and, on him and loving on him and, and God and praying with him and, what, and whatnot. And now he's pumped and he's like, well, I want to see this box. I'm like, oh man, it's like show and tell, right? So we start walking over and the guy freezes like he saw a ghost. He said, I don't want to go any further. I'm like, well, what do you mean? It started over here. He's like, no, no, no. I know the guy who owns this spot. He's like, this guy is crazy. He's like, him and his wife got a divorce and he went in this violent rage and he left out of work saying he's going to go kill her and we don't know what's going on. And he was just ranting and raving, just a lot of hate and a lot of anger. And just he just raged out. And I'm giggling because these are the same things God had sent about him. And he's like, and I guess he was like a warlock. And he had, he like put a spirit on something and sent it to his wife. And, and I was like, well, that's actually why we're here. And he's like, what? And I was like, everything you just said, God said uh, the week before, you're not here to confer con as a confirmation for me. You're here for a confirmation for my friend. Because he needed to hear that. He needed to know that God really does talk to people that are really our prophets. And you have verbatim said exactly what happened. And so he filled in the gaps too. And he, he's like, yeah, that's the box. He's like, yeah. He's like, yeah. He, he got his wife. And then after a while, his wife said he, she didn't want it no more. And that she had a bad feeling about it. So she gave it back to him. And he's put it here. And he, it's been here ever since. He's like, and I don't like going over it. Like, it just, I don't like the way I feel. And um, so long story short, I looked at my buddy and I said, that's the reason why he was here. On a, and it was the wrong day. He wasn't supposed to be there to clean until t the next day. He came a day early and he didn't even know why he came. He's like, man, I say, like, I pulled up here. So I started cleaning. And I was like, no, you had to be here because my friend needed to hear all this because, you know, he's been on the fence. Like, does God really have prophets? Does God really speak spiritually and whatnot? And I said, you are here for him. So long story short, we did what we can to do. We prayed over everything. We anointed everything. We anointed that box um, and we cast that spirit out of there. But the thing is that I had seen that tornado and I said, this is not over. Well, I thought we prayed it out. Here. I was like, well, we did, but I saw a tornado next to that demon on the reef. And I was like, the guy doesn't let me know what that tornado is. And I said, it's not over until God reveals that. And like for the next week or so, I was like, God, what is this tornado? What is this tornado? And then my buddy calls me. He's like, dude, you'll never believe it. Um, when I came into work today, the girl up front who manages the, the flea market came in and said, the guy came in all mad and upset, ran to Ravis said he doesn't like this place anymore. He doesn't feel right in here anymore. And that uh, he's done with it. And I looked over and all his stuff had already been cleaned out from the night before. It's like the guy blew out of here. And he's like, you hear what I said? He's like, she said he blew out of here. I said, that's a tornado. God was letting us know that once that demon goes and that tornado was going to blow that guy out of here. It's a spiritual thing he was showing us. And the woman used those exact words, he blew out of here and uh, he didn't come back, but he said he didn't like the feeling anymore. He felt weird and, and he didn't like it. He didn't want to be there anymore. So that was a second part of what God had showed us, showed me when we had, when we had pulled up there. So it was, it's just really encouraging the way it played out to not only know it was a demon, God revealed what it was attached to, then God sent the cleaning man 
to come in and clean a day early. And he didn't even know why he came at a, a day early. Gave confirmation to my friend who was kind of questioning if profits were real and whatnot. And then um, the tornado confirmation came like a week, week and a half later. Um, so it was just a really neat, uh, really neat story from beginning to end. Yeah, it is. It is a pretty cool story. And there's tons of details, which is uh, very interesting. The, just the fact that he was able to speak to you and from someone that hears that now, you know, probably some people are going to question le- the legitimacy of it. But there's three witnesses, you being one, but the two other guys that obviously saw, saw that, too. So it makes the story even more powerful to me. Um, and I want to go back to something that we talked about in the beginning. The first thing that we talked about spiritually was this demon that you would see in your dreams over and over and over again. Later, you said it looked like the it not it looked it it but it looked exactly the same as the Eddie from Iron Maiden. And a few months ago, that dream was different for the first time, and it's a really beautiful ending to that saga. So um, I, I want you to talk touch on it a little bit. Yeah, it's it's and it's actually encouraging. Um, so when we walk with God, or when a witch or warlock walks with the devil, you know, you rank up. You know, you become stronger. You either become a stronger child of God, or you become a stronger person in the occult. Uh, I always equate it to if you join the military, you start on boot camp, you become a private. From a private, you work your way up E class, and then if you go out of E class, you become a, a an officer, and you go up, and you can eventually become a general. You have ranks and levels, and it was the same way in spirit realm. Well, about two years ago, I got really, really sick. And during this time, it's been a humbling experience. And one of the things is that I've gotten closer to God and really just focused on God and what God would have for me and just trying to learn who it is that I'm supposed to be um, here um, when it comes to God and the anointing and whatnot. And you know, you don't realize you're ranking up. Well, this, I call him the Eddie guy from Van Halen. So the Eddie thing was always bigger than me and always powered down on me and it always tried to punk me. So this time I was getting ready to go. My wife and I, my son, we were getting ready to get in, to, to go somewhere uh, one evening and I heard something walk in behind me. And I'm, I thought it was gonna be like my wife or my son. I turned on the look and there was nothing there and started looking down. Now this thing that used to be a giant above me was now barely knee high to me. And for the first time, it had to look up to me and it got scared. The next thing I know, it turned and it ran out of the house because it came to do what it always done to kind of like punk me in the spirit. And he realized he's no longer a giant to me, but God had, you know, elevated me spiritually to where I was a giant to him. And so this was the one time I was actually glad to see it. And uh, it gave me so much joy to see it, you know, cower down and run like a dog with his tail between his legs back out of the room and out of the house. And so I got excited. I told my wife what just happened, you know, and I told my son because he's seven years old. We talk about spiritual things with him all the time, too. And and so it's just a really neat. It's just really neat. I have not seen it since, heard of it since or whatnot. But, um, yeah, it uh, it no longer had the upper hand. So praise God. Yes, that's a beautiful ending to that story. And. This story started when you were just a little boy. And now you mentioned you have a son and your son also sees some of the things that you see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, he's He's been a big blessing. I can remember my, when my wife got pregnant, uh, I asked her, I said, I wonder if he's going to have the same spiritual anointing where he's going to be a seer and he's going to be able to hear God and whatnot. And I say, because as a child, for one, I had no affirmation or no um, confirmation and was left feeling very weird, very isolated. Um, and I, wanted, I didn't want to feel like a freak, but in my mind, that's what I felt like. And I said, well, if he is like that, then I'm going to be very upfront with him from day one. And so my wife gave birth to a, a beautiful little baby boy. And, you know, we would see him kind of trail things you know, in rooms and whatnot. And I kept saying, God, if, if he's seeing something, please, I want to, I want to know, I want confirmation. And about the time he was old enough to start holding his head up on his own. I, I remember specifically, I was carrying him in, in my right arm and we were walking into the kitchen. So he's facing me. And I, when I got to where the refrigerator is, all of a sudden he starts giggling and I look at him and he's starting to slowly look up. 
So I look where he's looking, and sure enough, this like light slash white cloud uh, beam was slowly going up and up and up and up and through the ceiling. And my son and I, our eyes stayed locked in the exact same positions. And we both looked up until we were looking over our heads and he's giggling the whole time and it, and it left. And so I was like, I got so excited. My wife came and I told her what happened. I was like, he, he sees, he sees like God gave uh, the, um, God gave the confirmation. And I told her what, what had happened. And so as, as he is, come to more learning and more realization in life. He just turned seven. We talk about dreams. We talk about the prophetic. We talk about seeing angels and demons. And he has been very upfront. Um, um, Mommy, daddy, I saw this. What does this mean? Mommy, daddy, I dreamt this. What does this mean? Mommy, daddy, I heard this. What is this? And so um, at a young age, we've been able to walk with him and he doesn't feel like a freak. He thinks it's cool. You know, he's like all these different things. And, you know, I'm even seeing the prophetic starting to fall on him like we'll be riding down the road and there'll be something i've been praying about or thinking about or kind of like putting on the altar before god and he'll ask it as a question well daddy what does it mean and then he'll say exactly what um i've been praying about so it's it's good to see it at a young age now the other thing is is that you don't want to bring a child into that into that office yet because they're not physically emotionally or spiritually strong enough to to walk in that office or vocation and you don't want you don't want the spirit realm to get a jump on them. So it's just kind of we kind of keep it very very simple and and don't don't go into too much detail. But where I was walking around scared and closed off as a kid, um, he thinks it's the coolest thing, and uh, and he loves it, and we support him and whatnot. And and I don't blame my mom for not really saying nothing, but it's neat going back now and hearing the things that she has seen in her life. She had an uncle visit her one time had just passed away and she knew it was him. He came into the room. He said, she's in there referring to his wife or her aunt. He goes in there and then the aunt comes out like a couple months later crying said, I just saw. And mom's like, no, I saw him too. I told him where you were at. So it's, it's like, I started hearing these stories. I'm like, okay, like she's the one I got it from, but because she didn't know what was going on and she wasn't at the time, you know, she had gotten angry with God. So she had stepped away from the church, you know, she didn't really, didn't really bring it up and so there was never that confirmation or i didn't have a yes or no either way like am i crazy or is this for real am i a freak or am i not a freak but we don't hide anything from him we're completely honest with him and uh it's just neat to see him growing up that way yeah it's it's a beautiful thing that you can be upfront and open and that he sees the same thing you can guide him so he doesn't have to go through the the trauma that you have from your childhood and to finish this off, I want to ask one thing, because I know you probably experienced this and I'm I'm confident that there's people that are going to be watching and they're not going to believe anything that you say. So if someone doesn't believe in the stories you have, what's one thing you would tell them? Go to God. Uh, go to God. Ask, ask him, ask the Holy Ghost to reveal it to you. Um, and you say, well, I'm not a prophet or I'm not that. It doesn't matter. And I'll, I'll tell you a little quick snippet as to why I say that, I was leading a Bible study for new church members and just kind of teaching them, you know, this is what the church is, this is what God is, what we believe and whatnot. And on the way to the last, the last meeting of that class, God said, everybody is going to prophesy tonight. I'm like, what? And God said, everybody's going to prophesy tonight. I want you to open up the floor for prayer afterward. Everybody's going to prophesy. And now, I was scared, one, and two, I was very doubtful. I was like, what do you mean they're, they're, they're not prophetic? And God kept saying it. And so I was so shook up by this that even during the last class, one of the guys looked at me and said, man, what's, it seems like you're somewhere else tonight. Is everything okay? And I'm like, oh, it's okay. But I just knew that we're getting closer <laughs> to any prayer. And I was, I was scared. So we get the prayer and everybody's looking at me and I'm just sitting there. I got, I'm, I got my hands, you know, crossed in my lap. I just look at the floor, shaking my head. And they're like, it's time to pray. And I'm like, well, I, I know it's time to pray. And so uh, God said, tell him. I was like, God said, every one of you going to prophesy tonight. And of course, they all got excited. And I'm like, oh, Lord, like, what am I getting myself into, right? <laughs> so we, we grab hands and we start praying. And I, I start off the prayer. And this is when I knew it was, it was on like Donkey Kong. Like, all of a sudden, I felt the Holy Ghost just lift off of me. And I'm like, oh, something's happening, right? 
I felt it lift. And then the guy next to me just starts shaking. And he starts prophesying to one of the, the members in the group. Well, as soon as he gets done, the girl next to him starts prophesying to the group. And it's like this all the way around. Well, my wife was the last one. And I get emotional when I talk about it, but she not only prophesied, but she prophesied first person. And it, you know, God has shown up when someone's praying and they're prophesying and also start saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. That's God speaking directly through them. And she, the anointing fell on her so strong in the Holy Ghost that she was now speaking first person. God was speaking through her. It wasn't her. It was God speaking through her. And it's just like, he just, the, the spirit of God, the Holy Ghost was so thick in the room. It was amazing. And then all of a sudden it lifted off of her and it fell hard on me that time. And then that's when, you know, we finished up the prayer and, and it was just a really, it was, it was a really beautiful thing. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that whether you're prophetic or not, whether you're a seer or not, whatever your anointing is, you can ask God and God will give you a glimpse of it. He'll let you feel it. He'll let you see it. He'll let you hear it. He'll let you whatever. Um, the only caveat I add to that, though, is be prepared for what you're about to see. The other thing is, is that make sure you're at that place spiritually, you know, to do so. Because if you're not, if you're just asking God out of more like a, you're trying to put God into a circus act, then he's not going to show up like that. But if you are truly seeking God and you're truly trying to be as humble as you can and be obedient to God as you can, and that's the biggest thing. It's all about humility and obeying God. But if you truly, truly, truly um, humble yourself and stay obedient to God, he'll, he'll show up. He will show up. And it doesn't matter what your calling is, he'll, he'll speak to you. He'll show you things. And uh, just be ready for the ride because your life will never be the same the day after that happens. So ask. Don't take my word for it. Thank you for watching this episode of the Almost False Podcast. If this video blessed you, consider sending it to someone that you think would also benefit from it. And if you enjoy these kinds of conversations, come hang out with us and join our Discord server where you can talk to me and other awesome people. The link is in the description. Also, if you want to be on the show, you can go to almostfalls.net and submit your story there. We would love to hear from you. With that being said, I hope you have a great rest of your day and stay blessed.